Welcome to Healthy University, where we'll discuss issues and subjects on how you can live a healthier and more productive life. And now, here's your host for Healthy University, Alan Eisenberg. Hi, and welcome to Healthy University. This is Alan Eisenberg, your host, and I'm here today with Alan Standish. Alan Standish is a husband, dad, app developer, writer, and host of Inner Effort Podcast. And I was actually on the Inner Effort Podcast a couple months ago, and it was such a pleasure that I wanted to bring Alan back to you guys. Beginning in 2011, Alan learned to finally manage several of his own interpersonal challenges, including a 15-year struggle with an eating disorder and a crippling perfectionism. And that's funny because it's very similar to me with my perfectionism. Uh, but Alan began podcasting in 2012, so a little before uh, this show hit the, hit the road. And as a way to share, he did it to share his experiences, to connect with others, and to simply learn more. His podcast in 2012 began as the Quit Binge Eating Podcast, which then morphed into the Progress Not Perfection. In August 2015, Alan launched his biggest project to date, Inner Effort a podcast and blog that shares the tools and techniques that real people use to guide themselves through their own thoughts, emotions, challenges, and habit changes. Welcome, Alan. Alan, thank you. Glad glad to be here. I tell you, I I love the name Inner Effort, and I don't know why, but the first time I heard it when you said it, it just made me think of so many things about how I was thinking, which is that you know, a a lot of problem solving for myself was from the inside out. And that even though people from the outside were telling me things, I needed to believe it and then let it out of myself. Where did that name come from for you? That name came from about a year's worth of just grappling for concepts to, to explain what I was trying to get at. With my original podcast, Quit Binge Eating and Progress Not Perfection, it was very niche, focused on eating disorders and in my own challenges with, with my past binge eating disorder. And of course, uh, that then grew into me understanding my perfectionism. And, and it's been an evolution, you know, as I do this podcast, talk with others and the connection's amazing. I'm sure you know mm-hmm. that with your mm-hmm. own podcast. Um, I realized talking with folks, it wasn't about the food when it came to eating disorders. It wasn't about the perfectionism or the, you know, the other challenges that go with that. It literally is about <clears throat> believing those thoughts and emotions that we have in our mind and let, and letting that fool us and, and, and create these habits and mm-hmm. behaviors and, and feelings about ourselves. And I just, I kept trying to look for the right term. And suddenly it, I remember it hit me on a, on a run one uh-huh. day, you know, I'm like, you know, it just, it's all about the work, right? Because my whole philosophy, and that's why I had originally transformed my podcast from Quit Binge Eating to Progress Not Perfection, it's about doing something. You know, you can't lay mm-hmm. there and, and and feel defeated. You have to do something. Change comes from action. I remember just thinking about myself. Change comes from action. Change comes from – and then, aha, inner effort hit me. And I'm like, holy cow, that's exactly <laughs> the term I've been reaching, you know. And like all of us who who are kind of IT based, the first thing I did was ran back to my desk, all dripping with sweat, did a domain search, and I'm like, no one's ever used this. Oh, perfect! And no one's ever trademarked it. Even better. So <laughs> I knew that's where I wanted to go, well, and, and go yeah. that way. And that's so funny. I mean, that's where uh, you know I was doing uh, one called Bullying Stories, and and that's where I started. So where you were binge eating, I was dealing with bullying issues, and and my these things were haunting me. And then, you know, as I evolved and and learned how to deal with those things, I really wanted to do something around self help and and helping yourself, and and I think some somewhat of the inner effort concept. So I did the same thing. You know, I went looking, and I thought. Well, healthy university, I really want it, but but it's really healthy you. That's really what I want to talk <laughs> about is healthy you. So we you know every every college is you. So you know, I went and looked, and and sure enough, it wasn't there. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'll take I'll take it too. You know, so so because that's what I really think is important is this idea that you know you have control over you. And I was just speaking to someone the other day, and. You, you had just said something that, that um, I was talking about, which is this idea that 
Do you think that your eyes are windows to your mind, or do you think that your mind is windows to your eyes? And I explain that I believe your mind is windows to your eyes, you know, that what we're seeing isn't necessarily what's really in front of us. And, you know, of course, this has been proven in schizophrenia and, and other issues, but I think even in minor issues like I dealt with, where I dealt with depression and, and self-worth and, and these things, and maybe where you were dealing with it, what do you think of that idea? What do you think of that idea that are we really seeing reality, or do you think, you know, our mind tells us what to believe? <laughs> maybe kind of in between sometimes. It depends on, on, on how I'm looking at it. But I've come to learn that uh, for myself and for so many other people I talk with, what goes on in our mind is not the truth. Our emotions are not the truth. Um, what we see is just our perception, you know, physically, like you're saying, what we see and what we pretend other people are thinking about us and, you know, fear of judgment from others. And, you know, we're kind of making up stories in our head. It's <clears throat> when we get lost in our mind and get caught up in our own kind of navel gazing and thinking that this is the truth. Sometimes I think we get really lost and that and that that for me is my story and again so many other people i talk with so i it, it is about you know how your mind perceives thing but you got to make sure you don't lie to yourself and that has always been my biggest struggle again making up stories in my head about whether people are thinking about me and it, it, it's just not the truth whatsoever yeah. at all and so i don't think i answered your question very well but that's kind of how, <laughs> how i see things well well it's interesting you know the way the way i was explaining it you know i i have this 17 year old son right now and you know, he's a typical 17-year-old son. Nothing, Nothing's happy, at least when he talks to us. <laughs> nothing's good. He has Very no familiar. friends. You know, all of these things. And I keep thinking to myself that I have created myself in him, yes. which was, you know, this person that would constantly talk down to myself and to others. And then, you know, my feeling now is that if you say it enough, you'll believe it. Your mind will will start to believe your words. So he might not be really believing it right now, but eventually he keeps saying it and he will. So for me, it was, you know, this bullying thing that I, I couldn't get over it. You know, I couldn't I couldn't get past it. It haunted me, and you know, nobody liked me, and and uh, yeah, and I said it enough, and you know what? Then I believed it. And then my mind was telling me it. Nobody likes you, you know. You don't have any friends, and and I really think that that so so I think you're right. There is you know a double-edged sword there, you know that that sometimes we we want to tell ourselves something because it's just the way we are, we're built, and then you know we move into this. Our minds start telling us it, and then we believe it. In talking about teenage sons, I, I have two of those, and one of them's a tween right now. And oh my goodness, I, mm -hmm. I, I totally understand what you're talking about. And I see myself mirrored in those boys the same way. And oh my gosh, it's like, I don't want you guys to have a 20 year struggle like I did with hating yourself and, you know, not understanding things and, and again, believing the lies that you kind of tell yourself in your own right. head. So it, it is being a parent, it's just, it can be excruciating seeing that same type of behavior replicated with your kids. And, uh, boy, when you have that one figured out, let me know. Cause all, all <laughs> I can do is talk openly and honestly with them about everything and kind of share my beliefs, but trying to talk to a teenager about, uh, you know, Hey, your thoughts aren't really reality. You might as well just hit them. You know, they're like, yeah. huh? <laughs> well, just as, as you know, you, you were talking about, you know, working out and exercise and I'm a, I'm a big exercise person now as part of recovery. Mm -hmm. You know, I learned about endorphins and, and then learned it was true, you know. So, so you know, I'm trying to get my son to the gym. He's, he, he's an athlete, but not in a sport that requires a lot of exercise, but still the idea that he should do it. He should do exercise because sitting around playing games all day or podcasting like we do, maybe not the best thing. <laughs> Sometimes you got to get out there and breathe a little real oxygen and work your body and do these things because... It's good for you. And there's a great note at my gym right on the front, and it says, know that just getting here was half your battle. Yes. And, you know, I think that's that's another 
great point to make is that you know we have to fight that those things we don't necessarily want to do you know and i I know you don't want to talk about kids too much but kind of going back (laughs) to the kids it's all about i i realize that today they may not be you know getting out and and wanting to work out but eventually they'll remember you know dad was going out every day and walking and running and you know dad was being very careful about what he was eating there and you know i I, that'll come back to them i'm hoping in their early 20s versus their 40s and late 30s like i did (laughs) right get in line (laughs) (laughs) you know and for kids I'm, i'm just i'm hoping this is my fingers crossed and a little bit of praying going on with it that it's uh i'm trying to walk the walk and talk the talk, you know, as I'm, or, you know what I'm saying, uh, walk the talk yeah. with it. And so they see that. I'm not trying to be disingenuous. Like I think a lot of parents are, you know, do what I say, not as I do. So I'm hoping sure. that rubs off. I haven't seen it come to fruition yet, but I'm hoping. And I think that perfectionism, I know um, on the la- last time we talked, we talked a lot about perfectionism. And I think, you know, I know with my, my younger son, that's a big deal, you know, that he's ha- he's having uh, you know not being perfect and and not and 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 really that being a defeatist mentality and I know I had that you know it it was this thing that you know I felt that that's what I had to be and I think you know when when we were talking before you talked a lot about how that was really like maybe the leading edge of a lot of things for you it really was yeah yeah and so how do, how do you find that you know that idea of perfection becomes the curse later like what what in your mind leads that to happen <clears throat> when i honestly look back at it for myself it was literally i was trying to be perfect so no one would ever call me out mm-hmm. uh, or or point at me or you know it, it, there's a part of it of course and i think you know there's good definitions of perfectionism and bad definitions the good definition is you want your doctor to be a perfectionist when it comes to that <laughs> surgery but when you're writing an email and you know just for business and you're just trying to shoot a quick shot out when that takes you 15 or 20 minutes cuz it has to be exactly perfect cuz you want you don't want the other you know group of people that are receiving it and, and maybe it's just two people right and you're worried about what they're going to think about you and the whole time you're, you're typing it you're like i must be a moron this just doesn't sound right and all you need to do is you know the intent of that email was just to send a quick message hey this is canceled let's move on to the next or whatever they don't you know, I'm so worried and wrapped up of what they're thinking about me. And that just builds so quickly in my mind. Even today, I'm constantly catching it. Um, you know, and I, I guess that goes back to that uh, that deep shame response that we all have. And I can say that my shame response is a finely honed <laughs> shame <laughs> response because it, it's always that I, I, I can. But the, before, I never could feel it. Um, Alan, you know, I didn't quite yeah. understand what I was feeling. I just knew, oh, I'm, I'm not good. But now I can recognize and in the last year, eat very much. So I, I can kind of feel that feeling starting to well up and recognize, oh, that's that shame response. Okay. Ignore it. It's, it's almost, uh, um, physiological more than anything mm-hmm. else now. Right. Cause it is, it's tied to our evolution. Sure. And, but before I never understood what that was. And so that, damn shame response was just driving so many of my actions and 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 it was perfectionism that it was driving i just you know i didn't want to let anyone in and share my thoughts and and show that oh i'm not perfect with anything again i was the kid in high school that had the straight a's you know yeah. top of everything you know college is what took me to brought me to my knees because <laughs> I, I couldn't keep up you know i wasn't the smartest guy in the class or anything anymore at that point and uh, that's you know really hit me hard and it, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, I was just going to say, and of course, that uh, that's at a time when, you know, you're trying to impress the other sex or, you know, yeah. whatever and, and all that. It just went hand in hand and, and, and buried me real fast. I think what's amazing, and I'm, I'm reading a lot of articles, and I, I know we're, we're talking a lot about kids, but I think it's a good subject because I think part of what I want to do, and I, I, I would probably harbor to guess you want to do, is to catch people earlier. Like if I knew as a kid what I know today, right? <laughs> you know? So so today we have, you know, these colleges and then schools, high school, you know, and grades are, are not what they were when we went to school. I, I mean, I went to a school, uh, I went to Virginia Tech. I wouldn't yeah. even have a shot at it today. It wouldn't even be on the radar for me. I'd have to go to much a much lower tier school because everything has gotten so much more competitive. And I think that competitiveness and that level of perfection expected 
you know, by kids. So, you know, I always say, you know, C is average. So we're supposed to be a certain Yeah, amount, I know, C, isn't that? Right? Yeah. <laughs> but we can't be. You know, we, we've made this whole idea that you can't be this. And I think that puts this unbelievable amount of pressure on today's youth. And then to boot, we have, you know, helicopter parenting and and everybody gets an award and all these other things that, you know, by the time they get to college and now they're really expected to work on their own and there's no body there to, to sort of hold them up, you know, we're seeing a lot more stress, anxiety, depression, and, you know, other, other things, other issues with, with younger people. And, you know, I think, I think we both admit I, I can admit that, you know, my my problems were all from that stress, anxiety, and finally depression that I felt, uh, along with this perfectionist mentality, is, a, is like a terrible drug drug combination, right? <laughs> it's like, mm, oh, yeah. It's like the, the worst you want to yes, have is, yes. is, you know, you've got easy, you're easily stressed, you're easily anxious, and you're a perfectionist. <laughs> so... <laughs> So how, how, you know, what, what would you say to, you know, people today? Like, how, how, what did you learn? What was the big lesson, you know, for you, particularly on the binge eating side, when, when you finally said, you know what, I've got to change my ways? Great question. It all boils down to it started with mindfulness, actually learning mindfulness, hmm. um, <clears throat> kind of. I mean, not just watching my thoughts, but learning, like I'd said probably four times already, you know, that you're not your thoughts and, and accepting that as the truth. And it took me a while. Um, again, I'd spent years trying to handle my own binge eating problems. I, I think you and I are real similar. Like I spent a lot of time in libraries, reading books and all these self-help things and all these crazy, I don't, I don't mean to say crazy, but just, we'll call them uh, various techniques to try to use, right, to try to help myself. And most of them were coping mechanisms versus actually kind of getting to the root cause. And so as I began to embrace, I, I guess I'd, I'd found uh, a book, Mindfulness or Meditation for Dummies, which mm -hmm. meditation is kind of like a deeper sense of mindfulness. That's yeah. when everything began to break the right way for me. And it broke the right way very quickly. Just allowing myself to finally just be at peace and not, and just watching my thoughts and letting my whole body and mind relax and, and you know, resting in the idea that this is me here. This is not me putting on an act for someone else. This is just truly and wholly me and my own mind. Again, my only true peace that I ever knew at that point was, you know, by finally doing some meditation, which then the, the mindfulness really, I kind of taught myself emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. I was probably the most emotionally, um, I'm not, in, I'm gonna say emotionally intelligent, stunted person you can imagine, right? I, you know, I'm either angry or sad, you know, that's how I kind of knew you know, my feelings. That really, really wasn't right. a whole lot of in between or shades of gray, and I didn't quite understand. It was finally, again, I spent years trying all these other things and techniques. I, I admit I probably would have gotten a lot of help if I had gone to a therapist, but I'm a guy, and <laughs> I had the typical guy thing. You know, I don't see therapists, which is, by the way, the stupidest thing I ever could have said. Yeah, that's that's where we differ. So you know, not a problem. Yeah, well, I should. Yeah, it, I, I mean, trust me today. Oh, I, I would have, you know, if it's me talking to me five, six years ago, I would have been saying you need to go see a therapist. You yeah. need to go see a therapist. But the me then I couldn't even begin to accept that because, again, it goes back to the whole vulnerability and not being the person, you know, the outward hard ass that I portrayed. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and I think facing our demons is a, such a difficult thing. Well, to do. And, and when we come back, I think, you know, you've hit on mindfulness and, and I'm a big mindfulness junkie. I believe in it. I, I've learned so much about it that I would love to spend the, the next half talking with you about it. So um, let's continue that. Uh, we just have to take a short break and we'll be right back with Healthy University with Alan Standish from Inner Effort. And we'll be right back. You're listening to Healthy University with Alan Eisenberg. Deep in a dark hole in the recesses of his mind, Alan tried to bury all the bad memories of the bullying that happened to him. But memories can't be buried, 
and he would be haunted by his youth and these memories for a very long time to come. Then he must confront and come to terms with his own youth and the things that happened to him. Find out what Alan didn't want to remember. Read A Ladder in the Dark, My Journey from Bullying to Self-Acceptance. Available now at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and most major book retail outlets. Hi, and welcome back to Healthy University. This is your host, Alan Eisenberg, and I'm here with Alan Standish from Inner Effort, and we're talking about things like mindfulness and emotional challenges and how we persevered above uh, our, our issues to, to find a way uh, to freedom. And so I think, you know, Alan, was you were just hitting on mindfulness and you were hitting on meditation, which I, I do also is, is one form of mindfulness. But one of the things that always interests me when I say the word mindfulness or meditation, people think I'm talking about, you know, Eastern philosophy ideas. And it's really actually just a general, generic idea. But even more so, if you look at some of the Eastern philosophy people, philosophical people, and I've been lucky enough to travel over to Thailand and, and see the Buddhist culture, you realize what's going on. That they're living, and I, I kind of want to say a happier life with less. Um, oh, yeah. by believing and practicing mindfulness. Um, so, so how did you get into that? How did you discover that? Again, the, uh, the dummy's guide to meditation, <laughs> which, <laughs> which literally it, it, it was the, you know, taking meditation and breaking it down to where it's just literally watching your thoughts. It's, there's no right or wrong way to do meditation. It's a, it's a scary kind of word. I, I, and I realized that myself, but I was so desperate. I was willing to try anything. I mean, I'd even tried those hypnotherapy, um, mm -hmm. courses, which I know for a lot of people it works, but for me, I had, it just had no success. Again, I think it's because I was so immature and how I viewed my own emotions and even understood emotions. Yeah. But the the meditation for Dummies book just literally took me right into it and finally taught me, because again, when, when you're talking stress, I was pinging off the wall stressed. <laughs> I mean, and my blood pressure issues are what, 50% physiological and the other 50% mental. Um, and, and I know that and that's helped me tremendously because I, again, I had to get that binge eating under control. I mean, my doctor was giving me, you only have a few years to live. I mean, I yeah. was a very heavy guy, horrible cholesterol, um, just in, incredible blood pressure and on, on, and on pills, you know? And yeah. so I just, I had to get this under control. I'm like, I, I'm like, I'm a smart guy. I can figure this out. But it, finally, when I started meditation, it, it just led me to that just open mind. I, I guess going back to like, you're saying the Buddhist monks, it's all about, they, they realize every one of us struggles with monkey mind where mm -hmm. we got a thousand thoughts going through our head and they're just fragments of thoughts and feelings and flashes and in, in you know, intonation about different things, musical chords, whatever, all the time. And if we could hear our thoughts actually physically, it would just sound like, I think they're saying a bunch of chattering monkeys, just like, oh, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. And when meditation and mindfulness is just a matter of not being engaged with your thoughts. Whereas I was always, I have a thought and I, I would argue with myself or I would believe that thought, especially the thought of, you know, you just, you suck at this. You are mm. so stupid. Mm. Whereas now, and what that meditation taught me was just to watch it, not judge it good or bad, mm. but just mm. to watch it. And then typically those type of thoughts would um, just drop off. You know, it's kind of like, a, you know, watching the waves in a lake, you know, you're not, not an ocean, but you know, waves will get big and then they just eventually settle down. The same thing with thoughts. And once I figured that out, I was then able to start addressing a lot of my habits because that's what you know, binge eating and those type of things are about. It, it, it's a habit that's formed and, and then you kind of have to work on the habit. I couldn't even begin to work on the habit until I had some control, not over my thoughts, but how I react acted to my thoughts and to situations. So I guess to kind of go back to your point, there's no mysticism with meditation. It's just a matter of quieting your mind and watching the thoughts come and go, not judging, mm -hmm. just 
relaxing and it's important it's amazing the power that you then get, the recharge that you get. Even if you can do it for you know one minute a day or right. one minute every couple hours even, it, it, it's amazing. It's like it, there's no cup of coffee that gives me more strength than just a minute or two of just calm, quiet meditation, even in a noisy environment. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sitting there in the lotus position, my hands crossed and my, my feet, my legs crossed. You know, No, I'm just... I kind of learned to get into more of a meditative state, and that has been the most empowering thing in my life. Well, I can I can tell you, you know, I, I sometimes I listen to you and I think, were we doing the same things at the exact same times? I mean, I went to a hypnotherapist and, <laughs> and failed miserably, and you know, and all. Of it. But but you know, the one thing I I did do is so you know. As an app developer, you you might appreciate this. You know, I went hunting for an app for meditation because I knew nothing. Yeah. So sort of like where you got the for dummies book, I went to the for apps look look for an app, and I went through all of these apps, and most of them were terrible. And then I found this one called Calm. And oh yeah, I know of Calm. Yes, unbelievable. Now you pay for it. You know, it's not a freebie, and so. There's always something to be said for that. And I know as an app developer, you understand, you know, if somebody's paying for it, that means somebody's spending money to de- really develop it. Yep. And, you know, what it has is guided, unguided, anything from five minutes to up to a half an hour meditations on every subject you can possibly imagine. And what I really learned about meditation what is that, you know, sort of like you say, it starts with you learning to... Just let things go by what they talk about, you know, letting your thoughts be clouds that just float through your mind to eventually I just sit there and like I got nothing. I'm not thinking about anything but what it's telling me, which is, you know, think about your breath right now. Think about your your leg and and your and and, and I can go right into and I end up usually falling asleep. But, <laughs> but I'm so relaxed yeah. so quickly now Um and, and it's that same thing. There's all these things going on all the time, and we don't realize how how monkey mind we are, like you say. Or I talked to a, a, a social worker once who explained it as child brain, adult brain, sort of. Mm-hmm. You know, when can you, you know, when do you, when do you allow your child brain to come into your life? And so, so meditation was this great technique. I did this deep belly breathing, um, which just puts oxygen in your body and you know, that amazing effect of that and discovered that this mindfulness about belly breathing is not new. Actually, we're born with it, you know, and and you being a father, you can appreciate that getting up at three in the morning, oh my gosh, is my my child still breathing and running in there? And I always say to people, I say, where do you look? And they always say the chest. I said, nope, you're looking at their (laughs) belly. That's right. Because they're belly breathers until they turn into teens. And then they're and then trying to suck it in, in and look good and trim. Oh, right. No, and then absolutely. we turn into teens. Yeah. For some reason, we start becoming shallow, higher, you know, chest breathers. But yep. babies need all that oxygen. And then who's the happiest? When are you at your happiest? Yeah. A baby, right? You know, so, yep. so it's a great technique. And then, and then I find yoga and exercise again to still be mindfulness. These are, these are all mindfulness because I'm doing them for me. I'm. I'm taking care of myself, my own mind. You're exactly, exactly. You know, and you know, kind of some other techniques that I do <clears throat> for myself is uh, I still do this today. I keep these three by five note cards in my pocket, and depending upon the the stress of the day or I know what's going on, I have certain little notes that I jot down to myself to remind me to like meditate, or because mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm the type who go all day without doing it unless I, you know remind myself to do that or take myself on a quick little visualization in my head, maybe not a full out meditation, but just, you know, imagine this or gratitude practice to remind myself. It's just, I'm realizing so many of my own problems aren't just knowing how to do it, but to remember and to be reminded to do it. Otherwise, again, life catches up with me and uh, I just don't simply forget to do these things. They're simple and easy, but I'd forget. And then suddenly it's six o'clock in the evening and 
Actually, by the way, I've had a really good day today. I've actually <laughs> taken time several times, several little, I call them little mental yeah. breaks, just to sit yeah. there, not to not to flip out the phone. I've trained myself finally. By the way, this one took forever. I don't know about you, but smartphone addiction, even yeah. as an app developer, that's horrible. I'm, I've made it to where anytime I sense that, you know, trying to grab my phone, it's when I sit and put my hands flat on the table and just give myself one minute of nothingness to do. And uh, that's helped me so much in just kind of reducing some stress. And then I can focus on myself and what do I need to do kind of next? for me right. and I, before I wouldn't even allow myself those one minutes because I felt like I, you know I don't deserve that type of stuff I got real shit to do right you know right, right. and but man that is some of the most important time in your life and when you're on your deathbed and I kind of I think about this all the time when I'm when I'm on my deathbed what are the things I want to think about I want to think about my wife my kids yeah. you know and having that good time and then finally I keep I keep going back to this I don't know about you but I want to know me finally you know and yeah. be good with me and that's that's helped me a lot well and I, I, I yeah i've been talking a lot about this idea that you know phys, the you know the in the bible it says very very simply physician heal thyself and everybody <laughs> knows this saying but i don't think they realize what it's saying and, and what it's saying is what you and i have learned which is that you can't take care of someone else like you said you know you don't want a doctor doing something to you that they wouldn't be willing to do themselves. Well, it's the same thing in life. You know, you can't love someone until you can love yourself. You can't really develop good, healthy habits and relationships unless you truly believe in them yourself. And they even say it about sales. You know, you really can't sell something to someone unless you really <laughs> believe in it. It's the same thing. It's this idea that you know, take yourself out on a date. I tell people, I say, take yourself out on a date. Learn to love yourself. And this is not egotistical and it's not bad. It's healthy. You know, yeah. you're, you're the one that's going to have to live with you every day of your life, your whole life. <laughs> and you're the only one. And it's like you said, how do you want to see yourself on your deathbed? So, you know, go to dinner by yourself. Sit in a restaurant. Put your phone down. Don't have a book. And talk to yourself, you know, yep. internally. Do you do, uh, I, I, I have nice quiet places to go walk. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite things to do is engage with conversation with myself, actually external, oh, yeah. you know, and, and that has helped me a lot too. I used to always never want to hear, you know, talk to myself, but now I'll, I'll be working, through, we'll just say an example, an app problem, and I'll just kind of talk it out loud. And then I realize, you know what, I'm making myself stuck on this. I'm going down this mental path of, you know, let me pull myself back and I talk myself through it. And then suddenly... Mm -hmm. Maybe it's the walk that's fixing it, or maybe it's the talking. I don't know, but the walking and the talking, oh, my God. And then half the time I'll sit there and I'll go on a quick walk, and I'll call somebody, just a just a buddy, just a BS. Mm -hmm. And it's not one of those, hey, how you doing? Oh, yeah, by the way, well, I got you on the phone. Can I? You know, it's literally, hey, I'm bored. Yeah. And, you, you know, I really just wanted to talk with someone to clear my head. How you doing? You know, oh, my well, God, the talking it, helps me so much now. Yeah, and for the person who didn't go to a therapist, you learned everything about therapy. I mean— I believe in talk therapy more than anything, you know, and I tell this to people all the time. I said, let's just talk. I mean, yeah, just talking and, you know, things will come out in conversation and you'll learn a lot about yourself and you'll learn about a lot about what's going on in other people's lives, you know, but I'm sure you did it. I did it at, at some point we hid, you know, I stayed okay. under the covers and I didn't want to come out. And that's the worst thing you can do. So, you know, get out there and do these things. And I think, you know, again, as, as usual, I'm ready for a part two with you, but we're already uh -huh. uh, down to the wire here. And I want to give you an opportunity to let people know uh, how they could get in touch with you or, or what else you're doing out there that they can listen to. Because truly, you know, there are, there are very few podcasts I download. Yours is one of them. I, oh. I, I love it. I think your interaction you have a natural voice on the radio and and it's you're engaging you you i really enjoy it and i enjoy what we're discussing so uh share that with others so that they can get in touch with you well likewise right back at you and uh, i think my voice the key to that's the equipment but uh <laughs> <laughs> no no i need yeah. better equipment though. yeah i got my 50 dollars microphone and definitely better than my headset was the uh people can find me simply by going to itunes and searching for inner effort i-n-n-e-r space e-f-f-o-r-t they'll find my podcast they can listen to my previous podcast which were progress not perfection and it was before called 
called the Quit Binge Eating Podcast. And if you want to connect with me, just go to innereffort.com and I have all my contact information there. Shoot me an email. We can catch up. Uh, you know, and just just you, you even do a Google for, search for my name, Alan Standish, A L E N Standish, like Miles Standish, and uh, you'll find me that way. And uh, Alan, I appreciate the opportunity. I, like you said, we could do a part three, four, and five, and uh, I would totally be engaged and love every second of it. So oh, and, just, and maybe fantastic. we will. Yeah, yeah, maybe we will. And I'll of course have uh, your links on on the page with the uh, webcast, and uh, of course people can find that everywhere as well on iTunes and all the places. So. Alan, uh, again, what an engaging conversation. Uh, I hope that uh, the listeners found it as engaging as I did. Again, the idea is to make a healthier you, and I think this conversation certainly, uh, for me, uh, did that. And so I appreciate your time spending the half hour with us, and uh, I hope to have you back. Thanks, Alan. This is Alan Eisenberg, host of Healthy University, and join us next time for our next show. Thanks. Thank you for listening to Healthy University, brought to you by Bullying Recovery, LLC. This podcast does not replace the need for medical advice, professional diagnosis, opinion, treatment, or services to you or any other individual. The information provided here or through linkages to other sites is not a substitute for medical or professional care, and you should not use the information in place of a visit, call, consultation, or the advice of your physician or other healthcare provider. Join us next time for more Healthy University.